But right now, we're going to be talking about what's going on in the world today and about Sidney, his book, The Power Elite, uh, Their History, uh, Sidney and Their Future. Dr. Cuddy, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Why don't you go right ahead? Well, uh, as usual, I uh, <clears throat> make some comment about some current event and then uh, go to the uh, book, the latest book. It came out just about five months, six months ago called Apparently Their History and Future. And uh, the the thing <laughs> that I, um, I pointed out in the past is that uh, it's often not just the propaganda that the press feeds uh, individuals to try and condition them to have a particular response uh, psychologically to any government action or whatever. But uh, it's often what they don't say that uh, that uh, shows that there is a, a uh, an effort and a coordination between the paralyzed and the press. And we've been through that in the past, but uh, most recently one of these um, things that I've noticed is how uh, they've been covering the hacking of Target and now apparently Neiman Marcus and others uh, by this uh, particular software, which is very, very difficult to track back to its origin. They, they have uh, mechanisms to prevent it somewhat, but it's still very, uh, it, it eliminates the traces uh, of its existence, so it's very, very hard to, uh, once it's happening to, uh, to track it back to its origin. Uh, my suspicion is the the government has all kinds of capabilities of which we just we just don't know. They they have all this futuristic stuff that they keep to themselves, and they uh, they don't tell us. But one of the things that I mentioned years ago on this program was that once you get into this sort of global economy, then it's very difficult to back it off. To, to say, well, you know, we shouldn't have done GATT and we shouldn't have done NAFTA, and so let's return the way it was because uh, transnational corporations have stuck their necks out with funding in Bangladesh and everywhere else, and so it would ver- very much uh, hurt them and in turn hurt your 401k retirement fund and so on and so on. And I said something similar about the Internet. I said it's only a matter of time before the, the bad guys get one step up on the good guys. And when that happens, I said this years ago, I said the whole thing can, can become unraveled in one big, huge horror story. I mean, forget the 2008 economic crisis. Uh, There is so much, so much invested in the computer and the Internet and online sales and information and record keeping and so forth that the old days of, you know, regular book accounts of what you have in the bank and all are just, you know, a long-ago memory. But this hacking, uh, what I'm going to make a guess, and we'll pick up after the break. My guess is they probably do know where this stuff's coming from. And my guess is it's not some, you know, one guy in the Ukraine who has nothing better to do than to do this. Oh, you're talking about hacking a certain yes. end of the records. You're talking yes. about Target and I yeah. suppose all of this. Or could this possibly be some sort of a, 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 a black operation to justify ever more control certainly over our lives and, and doing away with credit cards and going to a chip? Uh, yeah, uh, and or and. It's probably government-sponsored. I can't believe... Hold that thought. Hold that thought. And I agree totally. We'll be back in just a moment. Dr. Kenny, you pick up the story. Okay, but uh, even if it were not a a so-called black operation in the sense of us doing it, uh, let's say that the Chinese, just, I mean, it could be anybody, but let's say the Chinese uh, have a a special, specially educated intelligence force uh, Devoted just to this sort of thing, hacking, just just plain hacking. And uh, there are various uh, sophisticated safeguards at the Pentagon and so on. But uh, you know, Target, Neiman Marcus, and these stores and, and banks uh, don't don't really have all that capability. So, uh, like I said, all it takes is for one time for the bad guys to get sort of a superior technique or knowledge to the good guys, and the whole ball game could could be over in, in this sense. Uh, let's say that we really do know uh, where it comes from. Let's say we do know that the source is in China. 
uh, let's say we're in high-level communications, even though the president isn't telling us, with the Chinese government telling them to stop. All right, let's say the Chinese say, oh, yes, this is terrible. We really will have to look into this. Uh, oh, look, it's these ten guys in Pyongyang, I mean, not Pyongyang, but Shanghai. Uh, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll look into that. Uh, let's, uh, let's go arrest them. And so they, <clears throat> they arrest these guys. And uh, they put them in jail uh, for a while, and then, of course, you, you you know, the justice system, because they're really working for the government, even though the Chinese government isn't going to say it, let's say, hypothetically. And so, oh, look, they've made bail. They're out again. And, uh, you know, th- then they say, okay, you pay a fine of a uh, million dollars, and so they pay the fine, and here we go, right? And so now... Hold that, thought, problem, hold that thought. We'll be back here in just a moment. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and Dr. Cuddy is uh, hypothesizing about certainly stealing all of the information from Target and then all the information from the other stores. And, of course, uh, my contention is I think it's probably an American black operation to justify increasing their control over our lives, maybe even giving us a little chip so that you know it'll all be just right there in our hands or on our forehead. Dr. Cuddy thinks it might be the, chi- the, uh, the Chinese who are doing this, uh, certainly some group in Shanghai, uh, but really secretly working for the Chinese government. What most people don't understand is our government works very closely with the Chinese government. People have forgotten that in 1949, it was the United States government that cut off all military supplies to the nationalist Chinese so that the Chinese communists could take power. We financed the Chinese communists. We did everything we could uh, to build them up. But the average American doesn't understand that. They're supposedly the enemy. Ladies and gentlemen, we create the best enemies money could buy so we can rally the people behind our government to protect us from the very enemy that we've actually created, just like we did during World War II and like we're doing with terrorism throughout the world today. Dr. Cuddy, pick up the story. Uh, yeah, and, it, and uh, about 1949, that's, that's a good example of how the, the thing works. There's a quote by us. General George Marshall Howe, he says, with the stroke of a pen, I disarmed the nationalist Chinese. And when we did send them weapons, you know, they might be missing a firing pin or a bolt or something like that, so they, they were totally useless. And w- what you have to understand uh, is that these things are uh, planned way in advance, uh, whether you go back to Sun Yat-sen and then Chiang Kai-shek and so forth and so on, and then Mao Zedong. I got this, there's this, a picture of Mao uh, way back then in the earliest days. I mean, it's you know, like uh, 1949 or 50 or 48 or whatever. And there's eight people, and there's a young Mao, and there's uh, six of the other seven guys, I think it's a group of eight, are uh, Chinese. But there's one who isn't. There's one who's British. <laughs> British guy, and he and I, his name escapes me right off the bat, but I, I can find it out. Uh, he was their their sort of financier, you know, financier. So what you have is this guy was probably a member of the power elite, so, you know, sort of like an agent, a colonel, house, something like that. And he's there for the specific purpose of being sure that you know they're facilitated in the ch- getting arms and so forth to fight the nationalists. Uh, Chinese, Chiang Kai-shek, while General Marshall is uh, disarming the nationalist Chinese so that the communists can take over. And you say, well, why are they doing that? Well, remember what H. Rowan Gaither said to Norman Dodd, 1953. We are under directives. We who had worked at the OSS. Now, remember, OSS is before the CIA, so we're talking the FDR time. We have worked, we here at the foundation have worked at the OSS, the European Economic uh, Administration, so on and so on, and we are operating under directives from the White House. That means it had to be from Truman, Truman, and from, you know, probably FDR before, to so alter life in America as to have a comfortable merger with the Soviet Union. And that was Rowan Gaither. He was right. the president of the Ford Foundation. If anybody would like to hear that, actually see it on DVD. I actually interviewed uh, Norman Dodd, the director of research for the Reese Committee, who had actually went to the Ford Foundation, and he tells, and you can actually watch him tell, said as he interviews Rowan Gaither, who makes the statement, uh, our purpose is to so alter life in America that one day we can be perspective peacefully merged with the Soviet Union and Norman Dodd said, well, will you tell the American people what the Ford Foundation is doing? And Rowan Gaither's reply was, certainly not. 
Go right ahead. Uh, right. And so uh, that's why you had all this facilitation of various communist activities, Fidel Castro, Mao Zedong, so forth and so on. And that's why we have more socialism in Russia in, in the United States today than they've ever had in Russia. We have more socialism and socialist programs in the United States than they have in either communist Russia or communist China. Go right ahead. Uh yeah, and uh, in, in my book, The Globalist, which came out about 15 years ago, I put a quote, I'm pretty sure it's in that book, by, uh, I think, uh, uh, Gus Hall, who's head of the American Communist Party, and he's uh, a big old long interview, I got the, the original, from, I think it's the, either the Pittsburgh Press or Pittsburgh uh, Post-Gazette, where he makes that statement, he says, and he's head of the American Communist Party, he says, there's more real socialism in the U.S. than there is in the Soviet Union today. And he was, you know, referring to Lyndon Johnson's Great Society and, and all of and all of that that went with it. And of course, uh, but, with this comes ever more control of our lives. America was different. Uh, we limited the power of government so men could be free. But there is an elite that wants a, a ruling elite to control us, and they do that simply by establishing socialism as the antithesis of freedom, centralizing power in government, and the government provides for the health and the education and the welfare and the pensions, suddenly all the public and the people become dependent upon the government, and soon they forget what freedom is about, and then when the whole system collapses, why there's no way to get back to freedom. And it's going to collapse, ladies and gentlemen. We can't keep borrowing a trillion dollars a year. We can't keep borrowing a trillion dollars a year that's being made up out of nothing indefinitely. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, and so uh, my point is, is not to say that it's, I think it's the Chinese doing it. The, the point is, the power elite is doing it either as a black op or the Chinese or the Iranians, you know, whoever. It doesn't really matter. It really doesn't matter who it is, but it's, it's the process. And you're talking about, of course, now about Target and uh, stealing. Yeah, the hacking. And the hacking and basically go right ahead. Right. And Neiman Marcus and, and the rest of them. So anyway, what, uh, what, hap- what it would happen is, it's probably already happened and probably already being discussed, that we know roughly where it's coming from, and so we've talked to the government, and you need to crack down, and they say, oh, sure, sure, yeah, we hate it too, yeah, you're absolutely right. And so these 10 guys, or 8, or 15, whatever it is, who've been trained specifically to be really, really good at hacking in their computer knowledge, and, and believe me, I mean, I've already been through what the, the people in China and India are doing with their, you know, in terms of mathematics in high school, they got 50 million, 50 million in China and in India, high school students taking, four, in high school, four years of algebra, four years of geometry, four years of trigonometry, four years of calculus and statistics thrown in, and they integrate all of the subjects. You, you would be lucky to find 1% of the American high school population uh, that's even taking uh, one year of, uh, of uh, calculus and, uh, and trigonometry and so forth and so on. They're even, they're even sort of cutting back on their common core curriculum from, uh, the, the math that they're taking already. But certainly nowhere near four years of calculus. They're not even taking two years of calculus for sure, uh, in, uh, in America. So, uh, the, the point is they're way, 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 way ahead of us in terms of their youth and their, their knowledge of the ability of computers. And so just imagine, just imagine this, this sort of cadre over there in Iran. It, it doesn't matter. Let's say the Soviet Union. It doesn't matter. And uh, they're, they're specialists uh, at hacking, and they've done this. And we, co- we know, and we complain, and they say, oh, yes, we'll, we'll search them out. We'll find them. We'll put them in jail. And if they go to jail, they'll probably be treated really well, and maybe they'll get bail, and maybe it'll be a year or two, you know, that they're free, waiting their trial, and in the meantime, there's another group of 15 who's, you know, going to do the next phase, which is getting into banks and destroying bank records. <laughs> I mean, you can see the whole process sort of unraveling, so that you have no privacy, you don't know how much money's in your bank, uh, the, the electrical grid is shut down across the U.S., next Tuesday. You know, no electricity next Tuesday because they hack into the electrical grid. I mean, just just picture this. Just picture the scenario of what the possibilities are. And I'm, I'm serious. It's literally a horror story. And I mentioned this uh, years ago. Years ago, I said, you know, just wait. It, there's The day is coming. It's just a matter of time before 
the 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 hackers get the one step up on the preventers, and that you know that's basically the end of the game. That's the end of the game, and we just sort of blithely roll along. <laughs> Things are just normal, and everything's fine. And so, uh, of course, the only solution to all of this is the uh, dict- you know the one world dictatorship, and that's that's it. You you have to be able to intervene all over the place, you know, grab people all over the place, and you have to be able to do it quickly, right? Because any problem isn't something you'll be able to take four or five months to sort of wade through casually, because you know if bank records get you know whacked, you you got you can't wait around four or five months to restore bank records, you know things like that. You can't wait around four or five months to reestablish electricity for the eastern half of the United States, right? So everything would have to be done quickly, and the only way you can quickly do something is if there's some sort of autocrat at the top saying, "Thou will do this." Now, that's it. I mean, you can't wait wait around for state legislatures and Congress to debate, you know, all that sort of stuff. So you can see the scenario as it's coming. That's what H.G. Wells said. H.G. Wells said uh, in one of his early books how this process would speed up. He said speed up toward the end. It'll just start, you know, steamrolling towards its uh, ultimate conclusion, which is the world, he called the world state, the new world order, and so forth. So anyway... Uh, all of this uh, fits with uh, the book that I did, the latest book called The Parallel, Their History and Future. And where we are is now is in the uh, chapter on the Illuminati. And while this may take a little bit, I'm, I'm going to give you the tenor of the times. There was uh, an oration delivered at Byfield, is what it was called, by the Reverend Elijah Parrish. And this was uh, July 4th of 1799. Now, this is the year after... Uh, George Washington, President Washington, had written his letter to a Reverend Snyder saying that he was perfectly aware that the Illuminati uh, was here. And so this is the oration that Reverend Elijah Parrish uh, was giving at that uh, at that time. He says the following, quote, It was reserved for Wysop, that's the founder of Illuminati, whose name would figure in a biography of devils, to organize a society to overturn the governments and religions of the world. A society which, for depravity of design and address and execution, far exceeds any scheme of Lucifer, any plot of rebellion conceived in the councils of hell. A society which would indubitably place its author first in the catalog of the damned, were he not rivaled in impiety by D'Alembert, Frederick, and Voltaire. Those are French revolutionists. They taught that conjugal faithfulness, chastity, and all moral virtues were mere prejudices of education. And we'll pick up after the break. Well, that thought we'll be right back. Well, Dr. Cuddy, you go right ahead. Okay, uh, so Reverend Parrish is continuing with his oration about the Illuminati. And he, he says that the, they said that they felt the possession of property infringed on human rights, that the motive justifies the means, you know, in fact, the end justifies the means, uh, that, you know, it, it's what well, we are well-meaning today. Today, well, we're well-meaning. It doesn't matter, you know, what happens. We can do anything to achieve our end. And then he says that the civil government is the only fall of man, that there is no future state, no God. These opinions are propagated over countries inhabited by more than a 100 million souls. And this is 1799. He says that the apostles of these doctrines introduced each other into every department of the community, they sat in the reviewer's chair. They guided the public taste for books. They taught in the schools. They lectured in the universities. They prescribed to the sick, doctors. They were the tutors of princes. They hovered around the throne and directed the scepter. That's religious. To finish this climax of guilt, they ascended to the pulpit and with unhallowed lips perverted the truth and polluted the pages of God. This society, after extending itself to Germany, Holland, Switzerland, and Italy, was formally introduced to Paris to all France. Their secret papers have been discovered, which prove there are 2,660, 2,660 of these lodges in the world, 17 of which are in the United States. How many more there may be, it is not easy to conjecture. And then he has a subquote, Satan when seeking vengeance against his divine creator, would have been proud to become the pupil of this modern Spartacus. Now, is he talking about Masonic lodges or Satanic lodges? 
Uh, well, he's talking about the Illuminati right. infiltration okay, of the Masonic fine. lodges. Go, go right ahead. Yeah, but but it's it, there's at that time you had the Masonic lodges, and uh, I actually quote from one uh, I believe it's 1792. I think uh, in, in, uh, in and I'll I'll get to that in a little bit. It's in French, but I I read I can translate French pretty good. Where this leading uh, individual, a uh, leading Freemason, he was so powerful in France that he was able to get Voltaire his job as the chief librarian in Paris. He was complaining how their Masonic lodges had been infiltrated by these evil Illuminists. Uh, so the, these are 2,660 Masonic lodges that had been infiltrated by the Illuminati that he's referring to, and then he's uh, talking about 17 of these uh, in the U.S., and then uh, when he says uh, Satan himself would be proud to be a pupil of this modern Spartacus, that was Weishaupt's uh, code name. They all had code names. His name was uh, Spartacus. Uh, and he finishes his quote by saying, When in se- it was 1798, all places of Christian worship were abolished in Paris. The nations of Christendom were shocked. So there you have, uh, as he said, all places of Christian worship in Paris were abolished. Hold that Paris. thought. We'll be right back in just a moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and suddenly Dr. Cuddy is simply quoting from a sermon by a minister who back in the late 1970s, 1990s, was talking about certainly the infiltration of the churches in Europe by this Illuminati. These were satanic lodges, many of them were Masonic lodges, had been infiltrated. There were several thousand of them in Europe. There were 17. Here in the United States, these were satanic organizations aimed about bringing about the one world government under Satan himself. They were tied into the Illuminati. And basically, of course, there's no question that they were here. Uh, they basically, they're still here. But they work subterranean. After all, they're secret. That's why you have the secret, so that people won't really know what's going on. But go ahead with the story there, Dennis. All right. Now, he's talking here in 1799, and he's talking about the people were shocked. And so then I pick up with my comments uh, in my book saying, why were they shocked? Well, it was because in 1794, this is five years before uh, Reverend Parrish's writing, the public was informed that from 1790, quote Mark, every concern of the Illuminis, the, the members of the Illuminati, had ceased. That's what they were told, 1794. Well, it's all over. They're, they're done. And that's according to a book called Proofs of the Real Existence and Dangerous Tendency of Illuminism, which was written in 1802 by a Seth Payson, P-A-Y-S-O-N. Uh, he, who also explained in his book that, quote, in 1791, a spark of Illuminism caught in Ireland and spread with astonishing rapidity, threatening a universal conflagration. That means it was going to spread. It was spreading, 1791. So what you had was the, the Illuminati infiltrated the Masonic lodges, and they promoted the French Revolution, and one of the key... Uh, individuals of that period was Robespierre, and uh, during the revolution, he had wanted to crush uh, the rival, what was called the Brissotine, B-R-I-S-S-O-T-I-N-E, Brissotine faction. There was a faction, and he he therefore criticized uh, Citizen Genet, who I've mentioned before, who was of that faction. He was of that faction, uh, who supported the Illuminist uh, principles. Robespierre was criticizing the uh, and what happened was Citizen Genet uh, came to the United States a couple of years later, 1793, as the French envoy. And he landed in uh, Charlestown, uh, South Carolina. Uh, and that's where Seth Payson's book that I was just quoting from was published. And uh, Rosebeer at that time, during this period, commented, quote, Genet, uh, their Byzantine faction agent at Philadelphia, he had gone up to Philadelphia, made himself chief of a club there and never ceased to make and excite motions equally injurious and perplexing to the government, end quote. He's talking about the American government. Now, earlier in this chapter, I had mentioned how Thomas Jefferson was an apologist for Wysop, and he was a friend of Genet. And uh, the seriousness uh, of the threat that the Illuminati posed to the U.S., you know, remember Washington was aware of it at least by 1798, uh, the seriousness uh, can be seen in a June 30th, 1813 letter that John Adams, who had been president, you know, second president, that Adams wrote to Jefferson, uh, dramatically stating, quote, and here's this Adams writing to Jefferson, 17, I mean, 1813. He says, quote, 
You certainly never felt the terrorism created by Genet in 1793 when 10,000 people in the streets of Philadelphia. Now remember, you know, 10,000 people today is something. 10,000 people back then in the streets of Philadelphia. When 10,000 people in the streets of Philadelphia, day after day, threatened to drag Washington, the president, out of his house and effect a revolution in the government or compel it to declare war in favor of the French Revolution and against England, in quote. So this is something, you see, that your history books don't teach you. But here it is. Adam should know. I mean, he's second president. And I think it's, it's so. I think people need to understand the these secret societies have been here ever since then. Why do you think they took God and prayer and the Ten Commandments out of our schools? Because the Masons control the United States Supreme Court uh, totally from 1930 and 1941 to 1971. That's why they took God and prayer out of our schools. Go up on the internet, simply type in Masons members UCS Supreme Court. Nobody will tell you that sort of thing. And th- th- these secret societies are sick control the media today. Why do you think that the media does everything they can to certainly belittle Christianity? Why, for instance, when the Duck Dynasty, or they or pray, they always end it. This is a great program, you know, but basically, they always end it certainly with prayer, and certainly uh, why A&E, the corporations that put them on, said, oh, you've got to do away with praying to Jesus. You might offend people, and then, of course, they did everything they could to disrupt the, uh, the Duck Dynasty program, they had to back down because literally millions of people in America were incensed. But the influence of these anti-Christian organizations permeate every aspect of the of the media, of our universities and our schools today. Because there's an intense hatred of Christianity, and they've even infiltrated our churches, ladies and gentlemen. They've infiltrated our churches as well. Well, Dr. Cuddy, you go right ahead. Okay. Uh, so uh, th- just just picture this. What you're told is, well, Washington was president, elected in 1788. He served two terms, and then there was Adams, and there was Jefferson. But if you're actually there on the street in Philadelphia at the time, according to President Adams writing in 1813, looking backwards, he's writing to Jefferson. He said, and I'll just I'll repeat this, he's quote marked. You, Jefferson, certainly never felt the terrorism created by Genet in 1793 when 10,000 people in the streets of Philadelphia, day after day, threatened to drag Washington out of his fa- house and effect a revolution in the government, so forth and so on. Now, that that's, I mean, even 10,000 people today in the streets of Philadelphia would be newsworthy. But picture it then. I mean, Philadelphia wasn't big like it is now. So uh, the the history you know that you've been taught in schools just doesn't uh, portray this uh, the, the 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 results of this effort back then. Now concerning uh, the effect of the Lumin- the Illuminati a- even after it disbanded you know officially disbanded in the 1780s, uh, Seth Payson the 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 person I'm quoting for this book he explained quote admitting that the order of the Illuminis is now extinct that's the official order back in you know 1780s. Their systems and doctrines remain. Now, now remember, remember what Weisop said. He says, even if you destroy us, I've already planned for this. I've already planned we'll be back bigger and better than ever. You just, you know, we'll be dispersed and so on and so on. And as uh, Payson goes on, he says, the books by which they communicated their poison are in circulation. The arts by which they inveigled and corrupted the minds of men are not forgotten. And the former members of this society still possess the skill the wicked subtlety to which the care of Weisopt formed his uh, his adept. So he's, he's saying that what Weisopt said he would he would do. He said, he, uh, Weisopt has said, you know, I've got this thing all planned out. If we're discovered and so forth, it, it won't bother me. You know, I, I already planned for that. So now I related uh, before that Jefferson was an apologist for the uh, the Illuminati founder Adam Weisopt. Uh, calling him in 1800 simply. This is Jefferson in 1800. He said, "Why stop?" Hold up. Go ahead. He said, "Why stop?" Simple was simply quote an enthusiastic philanthropist. That's how Jefferson characterized Why stop. However, in the hold that thought. Hold that thought. We'll be right back. 
Well, this is Dr. Stan. I guess it's Dr. Dennis Cuddy. And he's simply going into the history that is not taught in our universities today. It's very difficult to get the background because basically most of the books have either been bought and shredded and everything has been done to conceal the existence of the secret societies working behind the scenes. And those secret societies are here today. Dr. Cuddy is talking about his book, which if you haven't read it, you need to get it. Uh, it's called The Power Elite, uh, Their History and Their Future, and going into the background, and certainly, oh, certainly at one time, why Thomas Jefferson was an apologist for the Illuminati. Do you think he ever really eventually began to see how evil they were before he died? Yep. Yeah, he did. Okay, wives up later. Okay, fine. But he was brilliant. But of course, it was a wonderful idea. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have this wonderful utopian society where certainly all men could be free? The trouble was, of course, that that's not what the Illuminati wanted. That's what they said. They wanted to break down the existing social order and the kings and the monarchies and the emperors so men could be free. But what they really wanted to do was replace the power structure that existed with a new power structure that was under the control of Satan. But the average individual, the average Illuminist, the average Mason, the average person who embraced this, really thought it was all idealism and good, never understanding the truly diabolical forces at work behind the scenes. Then, or certainly most people do not understand the diabolical forces at work today. They don't understand why the media is so anti-Christian, why the Supreme Court took God and prayer and the Ten Commandments out of our schools, because there's nothing in the Constitution that allowed them to do that. They don't understand so many of the things going on today. Oh, but of course, what we need to do is get them to start thinking and to understand that almost everything they read and hear and see through the media, through our education, and yes, even much of what they learn in church isn't true. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, but they don't uh, see the, the public has been largely conditioned. They don't even realize it's not to think. Uh, I've, I've said many times in the past how uh, in the 1950s and 60s, and sort of early 70s, you if somebody called you up or was talking to you about something, say, well, what do you think about this, John, or something like that. But in the start of the late 70s and going into the 80s, uh, there was a change. They said, well, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? That, that? that was not accidental. They they were shifting from the, and I've mentioned this before, how the Deweyites, progressive educators, even in the schools, were shifting uh, youngsters from the cognitive do domain, that's the thinking domain, you know, reading, writing, math, and so forth, uh, to the affective uh, domain, which is social relationships and feelings. And they wanted to change that emphasis because uh, emotions and feelings are more easily manipulable. You can condition them. You, you have a more difficult time conditioning thought. I mean, two plus two really is four, <laughs> unless you do the new math. And uh, a particular brand of tennis shoes is good or not according to some objective standards, right? I mean, that's the way it is. Uh, but when you base decisions on feeling, you know, how do you feel about this particular soft drink, then that, that is something that can be manipulated uh, because feelings can, you know, be all over the place. You know, you love, you hate, you like, you don't like, you, a particular shade of color. Oh, yes, that turns me on, or, you know, whatever it is. So th they wanted that uh, shift because they don't want people to actually think about anything. And that's why they had to quicken the tempo of human life, as George Orwell uh, in his 19, book, 1984, uh, the agent for Big Brother, his name was O'Brien, his response to Winston was, well, what if we quicken the tempo of human life? Because if you quicken the tempo of human life, then people don't have time to think. You know, I don't have time to, to get into that. You'll hear, you'll hear a lot of people say that. I don't have time to get into that. You know, I've got to go here, go there, go here, go there. I don't have time to think about that. And so when they, they collapse time, they really collapse people's ability to think. And so, therefore, decisions are more often made on the, the ability of some sort of quick emotional reaction. Oh, look, the happy people are drinking Pepsi. I want to be happy, so I'll drink Pepsi, too. You know, like that, rather than actually thinking about carbohydrates and levels of sugar, you know, whatever it is, in an objective sense that you base your decision on. <laughs> so, anyway, that's that's the psychology of how, how they, they work this thing. So... Uh, what you had was Jefferson had been an apologist initially for Weisop saying, 
saying he was an enthusiastic <clears throat> philanthropist. And the reason that's important is because uh, a professor of divinity at Harvard, uh, his name was David Tappan, and he wrote this, uh, it was actually a discourse that he delivered at the chapel of Harvard College uh, June 19th of 1798. And he said there that the Illuminati operated only, quote, under the mask of universal philanthropy, only the mask of universal philanthropy. And Tappan went on to say, quote, but the connection... Uh, had this German association, I mean, pardon me, but what connection had this German association with the revolution, that's French Revolution, and consequent measures of France, question mark? The answer is the secret pa papers of the society prove that it had extended its branches into the latter country, France, before the year 1786. There, Mirabeau and Talleyrand, two distinguished agents of that revolution, the French Revolution, were officers of a secret lodge at Paris in 1788, that during the sitting of the notables in that year, deputies were sent to France from the German Illuminati at the request of this lodge to aid in the projected subversion of religion and government. Religion and government. And then, of course, that was the French Revolution yep. of 1789, the following year. Go ahead. Yep. Uh, he, he goes on, Tappan goes on, he says, The German agents, on their arrival, persuaded lodges to form a political committee whose object should be to devise the best means for a general revolution. From these committees arose the famous Jacobin Club, the Jacobin, whose primary aim was to revolutionize not only France, but if possible, the world. Uh, Tappan then explained that, quote, The supposition of some deep and extensive a conspiracy against government and religion easily accounts for certain newspapers and other productions which aim or direfully tend to undermine the religious and moral as well as civil institutions, principles, and habits of our country. Talk about the U.S. there. Talk about the U.S. Now, earlier I had described the connections between the Illuminati and uh, Yale University Secret Society uh, Skull and Bones, uh, to which the, the Bush president, uh, George H. W. Bush, George W. Bush, belonged. And that was founded in 1832. And uh, there's a, there was a newspaper. Uh, Dr. Stan knows there's uh, Kathleen Hayes. She used to publish this newspaper called The Trumpet, National Research Institute's Trumpet. And on the front page of the, uh, the Trumpet, October 1988, one reads the following, quote, Toward the end of the ceremony of initiation into the regent's degree of Illuminism, According to a tract, a skeleton is pointed out to him, the initiate, at the feet of which are laid a crown and a sword. He is asked whether that is a that is the skeleton of a king, a nobleman, or a beggar. In quote. Now that's that's what you know it says about luminism. Now, according to Ron Rosenbaum, in his article "Last Secrets of Skull and Bones," that was in Esquire magazine back in 1977, September issue. This statement that was made that I just read is quite similar to the word in German, quote, who was the fool, who was the wise man, beggar or king, question mark, whether poor or rich, all the same in death, end quote. Now, where's that from? That appears above a painting of skulls in room 322 of Skull and Bones. So this is a, another specific sort of linkage between the Illuminati and the Secret Society at Yale, uh, Skull and Bones. Now, uh, nine years after Skull and Bones was founded in 1832, that'd be 1841, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt's ancestor and the uh, New York Assemblyman, whose name was uh, Clinton Roosevelt, he authored a book called The Science of Government Founded in Natural Law, that's 1841. Uh, Clinton Roosevelt, uh, like the New York governor, whose name was DeWitt Clinton, was reportedly a member of the Columbian Lodge of the Order of the Illuminati. And, uh, and similar to Weishaupt's philosophy in the Clinton Roosevelt's book, the assemblyman wrote, quote, this is what he wrote in his book, quote, there is no God of justice to order things aright on earth. If there be a God, he is a malicious and vengeful being who created us for misery, end quote. Now that's in Clinton Roosevelt's book. And he referred to uh, other members of his order, remember the Illuminati called the order, as, quote, the enlightened ones. That's what the word illuminis means, the enlightened ones. 
Now, given the horrible reputation of the Illuminati, uh, one might uh, wonder why, uh, for example, uh, George W. Bush, in his uh, year 2000 presidential campaign, why would he have Illuminati online as his campaign's web server? I mean, why would he do that? Illuminati online. That was his campaign's web server. And this was after the president of uh, Illuminati Online, his name was uh, Steve Jackson, had developed a card game in 1994 called, quote, Illuminati New World Order. Illuminati New World Order. That was a card game with a supplement called Assassin. Assassin. Uh, one of the cards in that card game, now remember this is back in, 17, uh, in uh, 1990s, one of the cards of the card game shows one of the twin towers of the World Trade Center in New York City being hit by a terrorist attack. And another card shows the Pentagon partly in flames from an attack. Remember, 1990s. One of the World Trade Centers in New York City being hit by a terrorist attack. Another card shows the Pentagon partly in flames from an attack. Yeah, just think about that. Right, now, one of the first major pieces of legislation that George W. Bush supported was no Child Left Behind Act of 2001, that's uh, an education act. And what that did was place the Center for Civic Education, CCE, in charge of developing civic education for all of America's schools. Now, who is this? The CCE, they viewed its role as, quote, to improve our curricular frameworks and standards for a world transformed by globally accepted and internationally transcendent principles, end quote. See, you have to have these transcendent global values. No longer do we have American values. These have to be transcendent global values that we're going to teach in our schools. And uh, in that regard, they had this textbook called We the People. We the People. And on page 202 of that textbook, it states, quote, The culture we live in is becoming cosmopolitan, that is, belonging to the whole world, in quote. Now, why is that significant, that the word cosmopolitan? Well, the use of the word cosmopolitan is of special interest because in Ex Illuminatus, his name is Ernst von Gockhausen, his novel. He wrote a novel, 1786. Okay, he wrote this novel. And the novel was titled Exposure of the Cosmopolitan System in Letters from an Ex-Freemason, 1786. That's when it was written. Uh, one reads the following. Quote, the hero asked his superior very frankly, what purposes do the Illuminati have in infiltrating and now dominating masonry? The reply was blunt and simple, quote, to emancipate all of mankind from religious and political slavery, put specifically to advance deism and cosmopolitanism, world citizenship. What does it mean, question mark? You are either a citizen of the world or, or you are a rebel there is no third choice, end quote. Now, you note all those terms have popped up uh, more recently. World citizenship. President Obama keeps talking about himself as a world citizen. Uh, you're either, you know, with us or against us, a world citizen, or you are a rebel, and so forth. Now, uh, this is the future. The Illuminati and uh, the Paralete, as I call them, have planned for us uh, in Berlin, July 24th, 2008, uh, at that time, presidential candidate Barack Obama not only said he was a, quote, proud citizen of the United States, but also a, quote, fellow citizen of the world, end quote. Now, the, the significance of that word citizen, as opposed to, say, the word uh, resident or inhabitant, is that it has legal implications. And if there is a conflict, of course, between national citizenship and world citizenship, uh, just, you know, guess, which one's going to take precedence? Of course, it would be uh, world citizenship, just like in the U.S. It is, uh, it is a federal law that takes precedence uh, over state law. They would be the same thing. Now, one night, uh, I mean, pardon me, on the night of January 15th of 2011, during the uh, Miss America pageant, Miss Hawaii uh, was the first finalist to be asked a question by the judges. And she was asked whether she considered herself first a citizen of her state, of the country or of the world. Predictably, what do you think she said? She replied that she considered herself first a, quote, citizen of the world. A citizen of the world. Not citizen of the U.S., but citizen of the world. 
And evidently, I guess that's uh, more important to her than being a citizen of the U.S. And uh, what you have then is this, this uh, effort by the Illuminati 200 years ago discovered, but according to Weishaupt, uh, prearranged dispersal effected with the, the princes like uh, Alexander I of Russia when he became czar. He had been tutored by the Illuminati. They dispersed all their people into religious groups, uh, to the pulpit, to the educational systems, in uh, government agencies. And uh, 2,660 lodges in, uh, in uh, Europe that have, uh, were infiltrated, that means you had to at least have, you know, thousands of members of this dispersing all over the world at that time. So it wasn't just, you know, there's 100 guys who are sort of doing the best they can to spread this. If there are, there are members, and let's say you know, let's say there's five or six, just five or six uh, members in these 2,660 lodges. That's over 10,000 people. That's a, that's about 12,000 people, sp- luminous, Illuminati members spreading out all over the world, including uh, in the United States. And so the the effect of these people and their dispersal is uh, is tremendous. It's uh, you know it's uh, it's sort of like a network they form. It's like Cecil Rhodes said. When Cecil Rhodes mapped out his secret society, the society they elect to take the government of the world, as he said, he would only need about 60 years because then he'd have about 3,000 people in place, and they, in turn, would be able to appoint and select and monitor uh, others uh, coming after them. And he really wouldn't need a conspiracy. They would all simply be like-minded individuals with the same philosophy. Well, if he figured he'd have 3,000 people in place after six decades, think of what 12,000. 12,000 Illuminati members dispersed uh, 200 years ago could do. I mean, just think about that. And so they've insinuated themselves to uh, all sorts of communities, government institutions, educational institutions, all over the place, conditioning the people to think in a particular way. And so uh, that's where the chapter on the uh, Illuminati ends in my book uh, titled The Paralyte, Their History and Future, available from Radio Liberty. And the next chapter of the book uh, is titled The Psychological Conditioning of Americans. Because once you have a plan, you, of course, have to psychologically condition the people to accept the plan. And again, that book is The, the Power Elite, uh, Their History and Their Future. It's available by calling 1-800-544-8927. The Power Elite, their, uh, uh, their History and Their Future. You need to understand, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that America is on the way down unless we take a America back and return uh, to suddenly the moral and spiritual values that once made America the greatest nation in the world. We'll be back in a moment. Well, we've got uh, certainly uh, three minutes for you to wrap up the program, Dennis. Go right ahead. Okay. Well, rather than get into the uh, the next chapter, the psychological conditioning of Americans uh, that's in uh, this new book, uh, I, I think I'll just pick up with uh, what we've already talked about. Uh, when you shift from the cognitive to the affective domain, and uh, you, you use the schools to institute uh, this change of a culture, what you find is that a certain powerful organizations are part of this. Uh, so, for example, we had the you know, Sputnik threat in the 1950s, the late 50s, so there was this big push for science and technology. But lo and behold, uh, just a few years later, by 1973, Catherine Barrett, who was head of the NEA, president of the NEA, was writing, and I put this in the 200-year chronology I did on education. It's also offered by Radio Liberty. She said in 1973, she said, by the year 2000, we're going to get the basics down to just one quarter of the school day so that the teacher can rise to his true calling, which is that of a philosophical change agent. See, it's all about values. You would think they would be interested in the opposite. You'd be thinking if we're trying to, you know, beat the Soviets in science and technology, we want to emphasize science and math. But no, no, no. She says we're going to get that stuff down to just one quarter of the school day. Instead of all the school day, just one quarter so that we can shift to change the youngsters' values. So that tells you the, the thrust of these people and how, how very massive uh, their insinuation has been throughout our society, and it goes back to John Rawlings Reese of that uh, journal Mental Health in 1940, where he says they, uh, these professionals of his ilk, uh, 
uh, had made a quote useful attack upon two uh, two uh, professions: that of education, the teacher, and that of the church. Why? Well, because that's where values are formed. That's where value outside the home. Those are the two main places uh, where values are formed, and so that's uh, why they have to to reshape. Uh, remold it, as the Fabian socialists say, remold it nearer to the heart's desire, because the word heart means emotions, not the mind's desire, you know, not remold it according to thinking, but remold it according to the heart's desire, the emotions, the feelings. Well, I want to thank you so very much for being with us. It's certainly, they have changed the attitude of our young people. Yep. The young people at once certainly always so dedicated to learning and getting ahead. Now we seem to be more interested in just leading the good life. Well, what we need to do is change their values and understand that if they want to be free, they're going to have to be resourceful. And they're going to have to understand that this was a Christian nation and our freedom has come from our Lord. God bless you, Dennis. Thanks very much. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks for having me. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and we do hope, of course, you enjoy Dr. Dennis Cuddy, his book, uh, which we're talking about here. It's called The Power Elite and Their History and... Uh, Pardon me, uh, and their future. The Power Elite, Their History and Their Future. His other book, earlier one, The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan, goes into the fact, certainly, that the Nazis escaped to South America. So many of them, after the Second World War, dispersed throughout the world. But you have to understand that the Nazi movement is a continuation of this whole movement towards a one-world government. Remember what Hitler wanted? A third Reich. And it was a rule for a thousand years. But remember, Hitler was simply one of the manifestations of this whole movement. We have a great DVD. It's called Blood Sacrifice. Blood Sacrifice is one of the finest DVDs I've ever seen. It goes into the background of Adolf Hitler, who is acknowledged in Germany to be the Antichrist. They thought he really was. He was the spiritual leader who is going to bring about this one world thousand year reign. If you haven't seen the DVD, you need to get it. You need to get Dr. Cuddy's book on uh, suddenly the power elite and the secret Nazi plan and his book on the power elite, their history uh, and their future. Because if you don't understand what's going on today, it's, it's, you're not going to be able to prepare for the very, very difficult times that lie ahead. Our telephone number is one 800 Five four four eight nine two seven, one eight hundred five four four eight nine two seven. I really believe we're moving into very very difficult times in the coming months, and I say this not simply because I am a prophet, because I'm not, but I do know a lot of people who are very smart. Whether it be Gerald Saletti, who's been making pre- predictions for thirty years, or certainly John Williams, who we've had as a guest, who certainly puts out the finest economic information you'll get any place at shadowstats.com. Um, and both of them think that before we reach the middle of this year, there's going to be a major cataclysmic event that is going to certainly disrupt the entire economy of our nation. And an awful lot of people are going to lose what they have spent their whole life working for. So make your preparations accordingly. If you'd like to get more information, well, you can give us a call at 1-800-544-8927. Give my interviews with certainly with Gerald Saletti and certainly with uh, uh, study John Williams. We have certainly that excellent book. It's in t- called uh, The Creature from Jekyll Island. We have another great book by uh, Wood. Tom Wood is called Meltdown. Meltdown. Down and you need to get this information. If you're only going to get one thing right now, why don't you get the book Meltdown? And basically, you need to begin making preparations to protect yourself and your family. Our telephone number 1-800-544-8927. 1-800-544-8927. Eight nine two seven, and then of course we want to remind you that my ministry, Radio Liberty, is primarily listener supported. We do five hours of talk radio a day, five days a week, and of course we're heard all over the country. But it's an expensive proposition to buy radio time, and we really have to depend upon those of you out there who really care, who agree with us, who are involved in a spiritual battle, and if you're in a position financially. Why, uh, we hope you'll join the Radio Liberty family of supporters or perhaps get your your health products through us. Certainly most people need magnesium and vitamin D3 in large amounts, and they certainly need iodine and so many of the things that... Uh, 
will protect you and your body from uh, and keep you healthy. And basically, you take as few medications as you can because most of them do far more harm than good. I really believe that. Even as a physician, I will tell you that you have to be very careful because the doctors really don't know. I go to the medical meetings every week, and so much of the information they put out just is not true. Well, so the our telephone number is one eight hundred five four four eight nine two seven. If you'd like to get a list of the health products, give us a call. We'd like to get our catalog. If you'd like, Sydney. And to get uh, Sydney, uh, the other material we have, our telephone number is one eight hundred five four four eight nine two seven. And then, of course, we ask you to pray for America. We ask you to pray for revival. If you're in a position to help us, we'd love to hear from you. But if not, please pray for Radio Liberty, for our provision and our protection. And so, until Monday at the same time, may the Lord be with you. 